Hello, my name is Kay Elder. I'm a clinician and a scientist. I've been working at Bourne Hall since 1984. I want to tell you today a history of the events that led to the birth of the first two test tube babies in the world. So this is a story that took place between 1968 and 1978 in a very small hospital in the north of England near Manchester. This headline came out on July the 11th, 1978. Baby of the century. We now take test tube babies and IVF very much for granted. There are millions of IVF families created all over the world. But in 1978, this was like science fiction. It was a realization of brave new world creating life outside the mother's body. And a couple of weeks later, here she is, the lovely Louise, the miracle baby. Six months later, there was a second miracle in uh, Glasgow. Now Bonnie Alistair, the second test tube baby, the world's second test tube baby, was born. The wonder baby who arrived early. Now the team responsible for these spectacular miracles were an extraordinary trio. Uh, we had Patrick Steptoe, the clinician, Robert Edwards, the scientist, and very important and significant, the lady in the middle, Jean Purdy, who was very much a kingpin and a link that helped the clinician and the scientist to achieve their ambitions of collaboration. Patrick Christopher Steptoe, he studied medicine in London. He qualified at the beginning of World War II. He then volunteered for the Royal Navy and was a prisoner of war in Italy for two years. After the war, he specialized in obstetrics and gynecology in London. And he wasn't able to obtain a consultant post in London, but he uh, became a consultant at Oldham General Hospital, a small hospital in the north of England. During his time there, he was very interested in a new surgical technique that was in early stages of development. Again, a technique that's now taken very much for granted. But in the 1960s, it had not been used clinically. Laparoscopy. Steptoe went to France and to Germany to study with the, uh, the scientists and the clinicians who were developing the technique. He then returned to his hospital in Oldham and practiced and uh, refined his technique by practicing in the post-mortem room. The first live patient that he tried laparoscopy on was uh, a member of his nursing team. In 1967, he published this landmark book, Laparoscopy, in gynecology. The scientist Robert Jeffrey Edwards was born in 1925 in a small town in Yorkshire. He came from a working class family. His mother worked in a factory, his father worked on the railways, and in 1937 he won a scholarship to study at Manchester Central Boys High School. He also joined the army in 1943. He served in the Middle East and after the war, he uh, went to Wales to study zoology at the University of Bangor. He uh, wasn't very happy with the degree that he was doing in agriculture, and in his third year, he just changed to zoology. But he graduated from the University of Bangor with a very poor third class degree, uh, which wasn't sufficient to let him go on to any further higher study. But um, in 1951, he applied to do a diploma at the Institute of Animal Genetics in Edinburgh. And there he really found the field that uh, sparked his interest and his scientific career began to take off. He did a diploma and then a PhD in genetics in Edinburgh. Having gained his PhD, he then uh, went to Caltech in the States and, uh, and then to the Mill Hill National Institute for Research in Mill Hill. In 1963, he arrived in Cambridge with a post as reader in physiology. 
The lady in the middle, Jean Marion Purdy, was born and educated in Cambridge and she qualified as a nurse in 1966. She joined Bob in 1968 as his lab assistant. And as you will see as I tell you the story of events, Jean probably spent longer working in Oldham than Bob Edwards did. She was deeply involved in patient care and a major support, source of support to Bob Edwards. She was the one who was primarily responsible for organising all the laboratory supplies, including preparing media and testing during quality control, both in Oldham and later, towards the end of this story, when Bourne Hall opened near Cambridge. Fortunately, she systematically recorded and organised most of the data. As Bob says in one of his books, she was the first person to recognise and describe the formation of the early human blastocyst in vitro. Jean's contribution was essential for the eventual success of the team. Again, as Bob is quoted as saying, her cooperation had become crucial. It was no longer just Patrick and me. We had become a threesome. I regard her as an equal contributor to Patrick Steptoe and myself. Now going back to Bob Edwards and his career, during the 1950s and up until 1968 we can see looking back over his publications that he was steadily and gradually building the blocks, taking the steps that were necessary before human IVF could have become a reality. In Edinburgh, from 1954 to 1960, he studied genetic abnormalities in early mouse embryos. Together with his uh, future wife, Ruth Fowler, he learned how to control superovulation in the mouse. In 1962, he studied tissue culture techniques with John Paul in Glasgow, and they were able to develop embryonic cell lines from rabbit embryos. Between 63 and 65, when he was then in Mill Hill, he studied oocyte maturation in mice, farm animals, primates, and then humans. In 1965, he, be, he went to visit Howard and Georgiana Jones, who were then in the States, and he, together with them, he began to investigate fertilization of human eggs in vitro. This was a key point because he f wanted to study human eggs but he w it was very very difficult to obtain any for him to study. He was a young scientist and it was almost impossible for him to get uh, any human eggs from pathology specimens or biopsy specimens. Clinicians were not that keen to let Bob play with human eggs. But Howard and Georgiana Jones were very interested and using wedge resection biopsies from patients with polycystic ovarian disease, they began to look at maturation in vitro of human ovarian oocytes. Back in Cambridge with one of his PhD students, Richard Gardner, he demonstrated the proof of principle of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. He was also interested in solving the problems of sperm capacitation, which he studied with another of his PhD students, Martin Johnson. Now remember, although he was very interested in looking at the maturation and development of human oocytes, it was, he found that it was not an adequate source. He felt that he was missing something and he was very intrigued and interested in trying to figure out how he could get a source of freshly ovulated human oocytes. He happened to read a small uh, paper that Patrick Steptoe had written during 1967 and he suddenly realized that if he could collaborate with Patrick it might be possible to get freshly ovulated human oocytes via laparoscopy. In 1968, Bob was giving a talk on reproductive immunology at a meeting at the Royal Society of Medicine. And during this meeting, Patrick Steptoe, who was in the audience, showed some of the first photos of ovaries and pelvis that he had taken via laparoscopy. 
Bob immediately realized that this was a spectacular chance for him to study and develop his interest in human oocyte development, maturation and possibly fertilization. So he approached Patrick after the meeting and he was astonished when Patrick immediately agreed and said, let's get started. This was the beginnings of human IVF a unique collaboration and a very powerful partnership. Now the, collab the collaboration was full of logistic problems. Patrick was based in Oldham, which was more than a four hour drive from Cambridge, where Bob was based in his uh, Department of Physiology at the University. Patrick had to uh, recruit patients, uh, line them up for laparoscopy, and when ready to do an egg retrieval, Bob and his assistant Jean would travel up to Oldham, taking all of the supplies and equipment with them. This involved miles and miles of commuting. Bob also had many commitments in Cambridge, teaching, research, PhD students, and of course a family, his wife and five daughters. On top of this, their work was very, very controversial and it was surrounded with more moral and ethical issues. Many people felt that they should not be doing this. They had no real funding. It was an NHS hospital, the patients were NHS patients and uh, they could only have access to the theatre at specific times. They were hev very heavily criticised by their peers and apart from this logistic and ethical critical background, there were many, many hurdles in endocrinology and reproductive biology that had to be overcome. So over the 10 year period of intensive research, there were more than 70 publications as a result of this collaboration in Oldham. How did they do it? In 2013, after Bob Edwards sadly passed away, all of the data that had been recorded in Oldham became available. Uh, lab notebooks, loose sheets and records that were recorded by year between 1968 and 1978. So lots and lots of pieces of paper, lab notebooks, pages and pages and columns and columns of numbers and figures. Um, I studied all of this data and gradually entered it into an Excel spreadsheet, year by year. Having looked at all the data, there were 10 spreadsheets, one for each year, around 1978, and I recorded data covering 27 columns of observations that were made. Having looked at all this data, it became clear that they had many, many technical challenges to be overcome. The technical aspects of follicle aspiration, how to induce ovulation, the dose of HCG, the timing of laparoscopy, stimulation, monitoring, culture, sperm prep, insemination, embryo culture, technical aspects of embryo transfer, luteal support, drugs, dose timing. All of these were separate issues all of these we now take for granted as a super, uh, super efficient assisted reproductive technology that we now use. But Bob, Patrick and Jean had to work on each of these aspects individually and try to find a solution. These are the number of procedures that they did in each year, a total of 520 procedures and this is the summary. So 520 procedures of which 495 went for laparoscopy and 457 had oocytes retrieved during the laparoscopy. Eggs were found in 436 of the laparoscopies, that's 95 percent of the oocyte retrievals. 165 of the cycles had embryos developed, which was only 39% of the cycles in which eggs were found. They did 112 embryo transfers, 
plus six gift procedures, out of which there were five clinical and 11 possibly preclinical pregnancies. We identified 282 patients, which of course meant that some of the patients had repeated cycles. One lady in particular had 10 different cycles of laparoscopic egg retrieval. Their very first pregnancy was in June 1975, but sadly it was an ectopic pregnancy. The first two live births didn't happen until July 1978 and January 1979. There were two further miscarriages during 1978. Now looking at all of the challenges that they had to overcome, they actually achieved embryo development relatively quickly. These two papers were published in 1970 and 1971, laparoscopic recovery of preovulatory human eggs, and uh, they, had, they observed hatch blastocysts by September 1970, which is just over a year after they had begun. But it took another eight years before the first baby was born. Why did it take so long? This is a timeline of the different steps that they undertook. So uh, the first technical challenge was how to retrieve the eggs. They uh, introduced a new suction gadget in September 1969. That was the 43rd laparoscopy in the series. They didn't try to inseminate eggs until October 69, which was the 50th procedure. They first saw the fertilized egg in the 54th procedure. It took uh, 63 laparoscopies before they saw excellent embryos in January 1970. And they saw blastocyst development in August and September 1970. By this time they had done about 110 laparoscopic egg retrievals. The first embryo transfer took place in December 1971, which was 162 egg retrievals later. And then they began to look at other aspects. Um, monitoring the cycles until that time had been very sporadic. They didn't have a lab that was able to analyze the uh, steroid, do the steroid assays for them. But they realized that they had to be more precise in their timing around about March 1972 and started monitoring urine for estradiol in, um, in they started taking urine samples, daily, daily urine samples to monitor for estradiol. They tried a first gift procedure in April 72. They introduced luteal support later that year. They then spent more than two years with monitoring additional cycles, trying to understand the endocrinology of what was going on and why they had not achieved a pregnancy. They began concerned with possible toxicity in the media and oil and started introducing sperm survival tests in 1973. They tried different types of stimulation. They stopped using uh, gonadotrophins in 73. They tried Clomid or natural cycles. Uh, the first pregnancy was in June 1975, and that was the 305th laparoscopy. But sadly, as I've already said, this was an ectopic pregnancy. They then started monitoring steroids in serum the following year, and in 1977 a new assay, a rapid assay for monitoring LH in urine became available and they started doing three hourly LH monitoring towards the end of 1977. This was after 300 laparoscopies. The first live birth, Louise was born in July 1978 and her mother Leslie was the 400th patient to have laparoscopic egg retrieval. Why did it take so long? Well, the ultimate challenge of a live birth required a number of different factors, didn't it? They needed viable, healthy embryos for transfer, which of course involved the culture system. 
optimal timing for embryo transfer? Should it be day five, day two, day three, day four? How should the embryos be transferred, transcervical or surgical? And they also had to understand whether stimulation was having an adverse effect on the uterine endometrium and introduced luteal support. First, the follicle aspiration. This new suction gadget was introduced in uh, 1969. This was the 179th procedure. And here we have a picture of Patrick doing laparoscopy with Jean controlling the suction with the suction gadget. The timing of laparoscopy, they had to work on the correct timing to get mature eggs. They changed the doses of HCG and the timing of giving it. Ovarian stimulation, they tried many, many different recipes and monitoring urine, serum, what should they monitor, how often. In looking at the culture system, of course, they had very, very few eggs for testing. They had problems and setbacks, periods when things worked and when they didn't. They had to figure out how to culture the eggs, handle assessment. They worked on different types of media, additional supplementation, different sources of serum, oil, gas phase, quality control, insemination. The formula that led to the live births wasn't implemented until the end of 1976. They spent eight years of trial and error and troubleshooting. The first embryo transfer was carried out on, in December 1971. This was the 165th um, uh, procedure. They had to understand when the timing, when the embryo transfer should be done, how to do it, and they experimented with many different kinds of luteal support. These are the details of the clinical pregnancies that were achieved. The first one, the ectopic pregnancy, they were using, uh, this was a pergonal stimulation. It was a morula transferred on day four, their 25th embryo transfer, sadly, a corneal ectopic. The next pregnancy did not happen until November 1977, and this was just after they introduced three hourly urine monitoring for LH. Leslie Brown, Louise's mother, was the number 666 in the series. It was her first cycle. It was a natural cycle and an eight cell embryo transferred on the evening of day two, their 81st embryo transfer. The next pregnancy was January 1978, but sadly it was a triploid fetus which miscarried at 10 weeks. Alistair, the second test tube baby, was uh, born in January 1979. His mother, Grace, it was her second cycle and she was the 712th number in the series of laparoscopies. Again, a natural cycle. A further Pregnancy occurred in uh, July 1978, but sadly this normal male fetus aborted at 20 weeks in November 1978. Now remember, during this period when they were working towards trying to achieve the miracle birth, the background was really quite unpleasant. These are some of the headlines that came out around the time of Louise's birth. Third of August 1978, principally ominous. A step towards the point where mankind shall have the power to determine what kind of babies will be made. Biology threatens man's sense of dignity. Outpaces law and ethics. We're being blinded by science into accepting biological innovations that are immoral. So what are the eth ethical implications? Should they have been doing this work? The MRC rejected application for funding because they felt it was unethical that the patients were being treated as experimental subjects as opposed to experimental treatment. They had to find the right balance between the risks and the benefits and there were many issues surrounding information, voluntariness and competence to give consent. <laughs> 
The first embryo transfer was attempted in 1971. 169 laparoscopies since January 1969, which was 38% of all the cycles that they did during the 10-year period. That means that uh, the patients before who did not have embryo transfer were not receiving experimental treatment. They were basically experimental subjects. 106 patients had laparoscopy before the tr embryo transfer was attempted. And of these patients, 76 of them did not con go on to have further later cycles. So 27% of their total were certainly experimental subjects. There is a great deal of evidence that they were concerned, the whole team were concerned about the ethical aspects. In the letters that Bob wrote to patients, work is highly experimental from 1970 to 76, is still experimental, we can make no promises. Further evidence of their ethical concerns from their clinical management of patients. They were very cautious with their approach to ovarian stimulation. There was no evidence of any cases of hyperstimulation, no evidence that we could see in the data of post-operative complications. Very cautious about the number of embryos transferred. They never transferred more than two, even if more were available. They thought about whether surgical transfer might be necessary for the embryos, but decided that a second laparoscopy was not uh, justified. There is nothing in the records that we had that suggests that they behaved in any way but the highest ethical standards. And we believe that their intention to behave ethically was clearly a firm part of their philosophy and strategy. July 1978, the first press conference. You can see from the looks on their faces. They had each been working towards this moment for 20 years. And after all the stress and strain, the trials, the disappointments, 10 years of troubleshooting, a joyous moment for Stepto and Edwards. Headlines all over the world. But the elation didn't last very long. A few months later, test your baby, was it a hoax? Stepto was due to receive uh, an award which was cancelled because uh, people started saying that Leslie's tubes were not blocked. We must never allow doctors to play God. Vatican outlaws test you babies. An immoral act rules the Pope. And so, after more than 20 years of effort to reach the first successful result, miracle babies, had they reached the end of the road, test tube doctors forced to leave within hours of the test tube baby birth which marks a pinnacle in the career. The doctor announced that he would have to leave Oldham to continue his research. Stepto was 65 years old. He retired from the NHS. Edwards was based in Cambridge with only a university position. Everyone refused them funding. They applied to every possible source, the NHS, the MRC, the university. No one wanted to be involved in such controversial work. The only option that they had in order to continue their work was to open a private clinic. Of course, they didn't have the capital behind them and they spent two years raising sufficient venture capital and looking for a suitable location to open a private clinic. Bob was based in Cambridge with Jean and his lab and Jean was sent round to look at properties and in uh, the summer of 1980, two years after Louise was born, she found this secluded country manor house located near Cambridge. So they managed to buy the clinic, although it was uh, not in any way ready to be used as a hospital. It required a lot of renovation. But uh, porter cabins were built in the grounds and on 28th of September 1980, Bourne Hall Clinic was opened as the world's first clinic to offer IVF. <laughs> 
they did their first embryo transfers on uh, they first did the first two embryo transfers in on October the 12th 1980 unfortunately one of them was pregnant so the first born Hall test tube baby was born in 1981 All of the details, the data, the Excel sheets and discussions that I've covered in this series of slides are freely available. They were published in June 2015. There are six papers covering the, uh, the technical aspects, the ethical aspects, the role of Jean Purdy and how they managed with sources of support and patterns of expenditure. All of the papers are available as a free download from Reproductive Biomedicine and Society online. So, the rest is history, of course. Sadly, Jean Purdy died in March 1985. She had a malignant melanoma. Patrick left us on the 21st of March 1988 an individual who became a legend in his own lifetime. And of course, Robert Jeffrey Edwards, who died in April 2013. On Monday, October the 4th, 2010, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. A wonderful and remarkable day for Bob, all of his friends and colleagues, and the entire field of reproductive medicine.